so we are going to prove some very basic properties for any group in general uh, first is of a unique identity we kind of proved this in the first lecture sorry <laughs> in the first video i'm not a, i'm not a professor i can't give lectures i'm sorry <laughs> for the disappointment and just like i was making videos but anyway uh, we're going to prove the property of having a unique identity in in any group so so consider um, so consider elements a b and c and if it happens that a has two inverses b and c and all of these are from uh, g so i i'm claiming that b is not equal to c and uh, and you know a b ta a b is like equal to b a equal to identity right uh, and that uh, b sorry a c is equal to c a is also equal to the identity right so e is the identity element in the group g so can this situation ever happen and i'm claiming like this thing is just not going to happen at all uh, so we obviously start with uh, an assumption that if it did happen what's going to happen uh, yeah so uh, if it did happen then you can write b as well b times e obviously but then b times e is just b times a times c but then with associativity you can write this as b a times c but guess what b a is yes b a is just the identity so it's just identity times c but we know that's just mm -hmm. going to be c and so essentially you just wrote that b is equal to c which is like that's weird because we just said that b is not equal to c and so it's a contradiction so this situation can never happen like just proved it so so far you have unique um inverses okay I, I think we wanted to prove unique identity but anyway we just proved there are unique inverses fine okay let's go on to prove a uh, unique identity right so this was actually assuming that there's one identity already uh, so we actually have to prove that first so okay how are we going to prove that uh, you know there cannot be two different identity elements so consider there were like actually two different identity elements e1 e2 uh, then you you are going to have some really weird stuff happening so for every single element you'll have a times e1 is equal to well uh, just a and then e1 times a is equal to a and obviously uh, e2 times e1 is equal to a but also sorry e2 times a sorry right and then a times e2 is equal to a right but but notice there's a big loophole in all of this we said for every single element which also means for these elements themselves as well so e1 is obviously e1 times e2 because e2 is an identity right yeah but 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 now you can think of e1 as an as any random element and sorry uh, you can think of uh, e2 as any random element and e1 as an identity and so what's going to happen is you can write this as e2 yeah so we just proved that e1 is equal to e2 which is weird right because we started with the assumption that these are different elements uh, so you clearly cannot have two different identities okay that's cool um, yes now let's go to uh, yeah okay let's go to um, I don't think that one is better uh, never mind on that fine so let's go to some very basic definitions uh, the order of a group and the order of an element right so consider any uh, element g in capital g you take the identity then you multiply it by g and you get some element uh, g obviously you multiply it by g again you get g square keep multiplying you get like g cube and, and whatever so you just keep multiplying this and you can't just keep on going forever right because you know by the pigeonhole principle you you are eventually going to go back into the group you can't go out of the group because of the way the groups are defined closure right and so you eventually have to at some point go back to one of the elements and so let's say you go back to so like you keep doing this and just have a g power k and now you have to go back to uh, some element right so it will be one of these elements only because it can't be any other element because then you would have like already put that in there right so 
keep going and then you have to repeat at some point and so let's say it was something like g power i don't know x i think right uh, so you already had g power x somewhere and then like you keep you keep multiplying you reach a g power k and then you go back to g power x or whatever uh, so essentially like g power k minus x or i should write it like better right i think so g power x or more like okay g power k plus one that that's another way of writing it uh, that's equal to g power x right but then g power k plus one is clearly just g power k plus one minus x times g power x and that's equal to g power x but remember g power x is just some element in the group right so you can have its inverse you can multiply to the right by it and then what's going to happen is like g power k plus one minus x that's equal to the identity right yeah so eventually what you are going to get like in this whole thing if you just keep multiplying is the identity because at some point this point particularly you are going to get identity right uh, so yeah so so the series of just multiplying by g over and over again essentially going to look something like this e multiply by g get g power 1 multiply by g get g squared so on like till maybe like g power m and then multiply by g again and then you just get identity right or I should say g power m minus 1 and then multiply by g and you get identity so essentially g power m that's equal to e and so when the first time this happens um, right so for the first m that this happens that's called the order of g so the order of an element g that's the minimum of of n such that g power n is equal to e easy to see that right uh, what's the order of a group? Well, it's just the cardinality. Yeah. Yeah, okay. I made a big deal out of it. It's just the cardinality. Really. Uh, so, cool. So, so far we figured out what the order of of a element is. What the order of a group is. Well, that's actually like this. I don't know. Okay. Cool. At least for a finite group, that's the way it is. Uh, right. Now let's go into generators and generating a group. So the dihedral group, uh, if you remember, you could you could write every single element as you know some power of uh, R and S, right? So you could write elements as identity R, so which is like essentially R power zero, if you want to think of it like that. And then R power one, R power two, and then you had S and so s r power 0 if you want and then like s r power 1 s uh, r power 2 right so everything can be written just with these two literals right um, so the hydral group is also sometimes written like this it's generated by r and s such that r power so the dihedral group order 3 obviously uh, that's equal to identity should write e and s square is equal to identity because clearly s square is that it will like reflect once reflect twice that's the same thing uh yes so this is another way of writing d3 in general for dn that would be something like r s such that r power n equal to e and then s square equal to e that's the dihedral group of n order okay. uh but what we are seeing over here is something called the the cyclic sorry the the, the generator uh, notation right so, so R and S, this set is a generating set of the group DN, right? So a generating set is any um, set of elements where you sort of combine elements in like some fashion and that's supposed to generate the whole group, right? So all different combinations of elements is going to give you the whole group. So let's say that you had elements S1, S2, so on till Sn right as as your generating set uh, then the group generated by this would be basically like i don't know you just take nothing so just the identity and then you could have like maybe s1 and like s2 so on till sn or you could have like s1 multiplied by s2 or maybe like it's inverse right so you could also have s1 inverse s2 inverse so on SN. Uh, or you could have like s1 and then sorry uh, S1 and then you know uh, 
S2 itself or maybe like S1, S3, S1, S3 inverse, whatever. So you just like keep going like forever and so on. Uh, but at, at some point you're going to like go back to the set itself because of the way that groups work, closure, right? If it's a finite group, you just like jump back to the whole thing. Um, and so, yeah, I just keep doing this sort of thing and eventually just get the whole group. And so, so this set generates uh, the group as in it's a it's a generating set now this is a good place to uh, to sort of tell what a free group is so if you remember the dihedral group was written like this it's it's rs such that r power n equal to 1 and s square equal to 1 right i should say e but whatever now what if you didn't have these two restrictions right so it's just r and s in that case, what you get is something called a free group. So what happens is, okay, you start off at identity. You can multiply, so it's a free group of order two. Uh, order two? I should say a free group of, of two elements, right? So uh, you can multiply by R. I shouldn't even use R and S. Let's just use some two elements, A, B, right? So let's say you can multiply by A uh, to go to A, obviously. Or you can multiply by A inverse, and then you go to A. Or you can multiply by B, maybe, and then you go to B and then B inverse and you go to B inverse and from there you can multiply by let's say B or B inverse or whatever and then you go to like AB, AB inverse and so, and, and so you just keep doing this like forever you can multiply by another A over here and that's like A squared so you get this nice fractal pattern so I'm going to use red lines to represent uh, multiplying by A and uh, arrows to present in which direction is the positive exponent in which direction is the negative exponent and black or let's say blue lines to represent thing by p right okay so this is like multiplying by a this is why uh, so in the reverse direction would be the a inverse and this is like with b cool uh, so essentially you start off at the identity now over here you get to a over here you get to b this is b inverse is a inverse and then you have a fractal pattern right I, I think i told you that so again once again multiply by a bit uh you can once again go back i i suppose from here and you can sort of like keep multiplying so yeah but you can also multiply in the other direction so you can multiply by b uh, a bit and then maybe b inverse and actually like keep going who, who knows right so like this and like that and you know just you, you guess this it is like a really nice fractal pattern out of this like yeah it, it is beautiful to look at but like really hard to draw i don't know but i think you got the idea right what, what i'm trying to do as in you can you can get all of these uh, different elements in a sense right so that's called a free group so it's just the literals and then you generate everything possible from the literals and so now the group operation once again just multiplication but the way the multiplication happens looks more like concatenation actually uh, obviously you have some uh, obvious things like you know a a inverse that is going to be the identity so in, in your string of literals you you can't really have something like this. You, you gotta have like A, B, A inverse, B, A, something like that. You can't have A, A inverse, B, something. This is not allowed. This can't be an element of the free group. Because obviously this would be like reduced to something else. right? I mean it is an element but it's just not a very good way to write it. So essentially you can write this free group as like, uh, so you, you, you define this thing called sigma which is like all the characters that you're going to represent the free group like a a inverse b b inverse and then the free group is like the set of every every element uh, s in sigma star such that you know a a inverse is not a substring of uh, i don't know how i'm going to like write it i think i think this is like it contains it so not in that's that's a programmer notation but it's okay 
And like BB inverse not in S. Uh, a inverse A not in S. And then uh, B inverse B not in S. And obviously the identity is not in S if uh, the length of S is bigger than 1. If it's 1, it's okay. You can have that, right? And so that's what uh, the free group in like 2 would be. Essentially. And you can generalize to multiple, right? Now, a nice thing you notice is that if you add more restrictions, then then you like get some really nice properties uh, relating a free group and any general group. Um, you know, there's this theorem like uh, every group is isomorphic to a quotient of a free group. That's that's heavy words and a lot of jargon that I'm throwing at you, but it's important. Like this this thing is actually important. They're going to use it somewhere. Okay, cool. Uh, and this notation is something that you catch on from stuff like theory of computation and like automata theory. But trust me, this is not important. <laughs> the intuition behind it is more important. So now you kind of know what a free group is. You uh, also know these sort of basic properties. All right, cool. So now uh, let's go to a nice thing called a subgroup. So you all, we already discussed that every element in any group is so. Uh, if a group like acts on on X, right? So for any uh, element G in uh, capital G, well, G is also an element of the symmetric group on capital X, right? Um, so what we can say is that this group G. It's a subset of S X, and both of these are groups. So what we say is that it's a subgroup of uh, S X, and we write it like this: less than or equal to. Yes, abuse of notation. I don't know who who came up with this, but yeah, that's the way we write it. They could have like really just used this thing, but then this already has a meaning of subset. So G less than or equal to S X is more, you know, like restrictive as in it's only groups. It's not just sets, right? Okay, uh, so this lesson or equal to mean that G could possibly be just all of S X, uh, but if you if you see this thing, then that means it's a proper subgroup, and then it cannot be S X. Right. So uh, yeah, a, a subgroup is like pretty easy, you know, to define, but it's very hard, not that hard actually, but it's harder to test whether or not a certain thing is a subgroup. And that's where we come up with this thing called the subgroup test. Right? So the subgroup test is something like this. So if you have an H, a set, which is a subset of the elements of a group G, then uh, H is a subgroup of G if and only if uh, for all for all uh, x y in H. Essentially, x y inverse is also in H. Uh, so notice that x y inverse is like defined at this point because x y in h implies that x y in g, and so x y inverse is okay. You can define it, <laughs> right? Okay, cool. So uh, let's try to prove the uh, both the directions. Let's try to first go with this, implying that. So if it's a subgroup, then obviously uh, y in h implies that y inverse is in h. Uh, and then x y x y inverse are both in H, and that implies that x y inverse is in H, right? Yeah. And so yeah, this like just happens. Okay, let's try to go the opposite way. Uh, that if you know for all elements in x y this happens, then H must be a subgroup of uh, G, right? So first notice that. You can put y as x in this, so you just have x and x for, like, for any other arbitrary element x. You just have for x x in h, x x inverse is also in h, which means that the identity element is in h. So that's like the first requirement is there. Okay, cool. Uh, next, you want to prove that the inverses are also in h. So since identity is in h, you can put an E over there, so it's like E Y is in H, and that obviously implies that uh, Y inverse is in H because like this is something that we are assuming, 
is true so the identity is there the inverses are also there cool that's two things down the line cool now we can prove closer so so for any element uh, any two elements x y in h we kind of know that x is obviously in h like yeah but y inverse is also in h right because of the last property that we showed that inverses are in h uh, so since x y are uh, x and y inverse are like now two elements which are in h you can use this property again and then say that okay x y inverse inverse is also in h but that clearly means it's like x y is in h so for any x and y in h x y is in h and so we prove the closure property as well so it has an identity it also has inverses and there's closure and obviously it's associativity because of the operation itself uh, yeah i mean g is a group so come on the operation is also supposed to be associative what that means is that yeah uh, if this thing happens then h is a subgroup so that's called a subgroup test all right cool uh finally let's go to something called the conjugate of a group uh which i'm going to finish off in the in the next video but it will be kind of like important okay so so consider a, a subgroup of g and let's consider also any random element in uh in g right and it may or may not be in h like we don't really care uh so 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 this oper so, so what i'm going to define is uh, is called the conjugate of h with g and that's essentially this thing so so for every element in capital h you multiply by g and multiply by g inverse on left and right and that gives you the conjugate sometimes you you write it as g inverse h g that's the conjugate but like i i just don't care like really it still sort of does the same thing so who cares uh yeah okay so notice that this thing is still a group right uh and we're going to prove it like using the subgroup test so for any two elements um x y in g h g inverse what's going to happen is that you can write x as something like g h 1 uh g inverse and y as g h2 g inverse right and so y inverse would just be something like you know you just take the inverse of this thing which we know like we know or more like we can guess you know our guess is like unique so we actually know essentially is it's going to be g h2 inverse g you don't you don't trust me well like try you know so it should be g inverse okay try multiplying this in both orders you will see it's the same right it, it just gives the identity uh yeah so then what's x y inverse well that's just g h1 h2 inverse and g inverse but we know that h1 h2 are just elements of capital h right uh where you know h1 h2 are in capital h uh so h1 h2 inverse is also in capital h like from the subgroup test itself right because we just did that come on like you can't forget that like we just know that for all h1 h2 in capital h the subgroup test says that h1 h2 inverse is also in capital h and so we know that this thing is just something else that's in capital h so call it h3 and so what we have shown is that um xy can be written as g h3 g inverse for some element h3 in capital h which means uh that sorry not xy xy inverse so that means like xy inverse is in g h g inverse because the way it's defined right it's in this set essentially uh yeah so what we just proved is that for all xy in g h g inverse xy inverse is in g h g inverse which means that g h g inverse is a subgroup yep and obviously like gh g inverse is like a subset of uh of g like obviously because of the closure property uh but now we have shown that it's also the it's also a subgroup right now it might sometimes happen that you know the the thing this thing that we're doing gh uh, g inverse this does not essentially like give us anything new it just gives us h right 
like if this group was commutative the operation was commutative this would certainly happen but sometimes it's not commutative and then you get weird stuff like you know you, you get like rd rd in r inverse like you know matrix multiplication it's not commutative so you get stuff like that uh, but yeah what we are seeing is that sometimes it is h and those times give us two sort of things uh the normalizer and the centralizer which i'm going to discuss later but for now you just need to know what what this thing is it's called a conjugate of the group uh i'm like a conjugate yeah, okay so i'm just going to call it conjugate of the group uh and in general for any element uh for any element in g uh g h g inverse is is also referred to as sometimes you know the is referred to as lambda g of h uh, this is the conjugate of h with the operation g right so it's conjugated with g uh yeah i've spoken a bit too much but if i keep going this might be a bit too long of a video uh so yeah i'll see you guys in the next video but so far we have discussed these things uh, a unique identity a unique inverse what a subgroup is what's the order card like what order of a group order of an element uh the subgroup test a conjugate uh, of the element and the conjugate of a group so this thing is a conjugate of an element this whole thing is a conjugate of the group right uh, similar to the, like this notation you also have this notation right uh, so this thing is called a, a coset or something but we'll go to that later so for now this is like uh, sufficient so i'll see you guys in the next video